Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Yonit Arthur. You are on The Steady Coach, and it is truly my honor today to bring you this interview with one of the most experienced and knowledgeable clinicians in the entire mind-body world, Georgie Oldfield. Georgie is a physiotherapist and has been using mind-body techniques to work with medically unexplained chronic symptoms like chronic dizziness for nearly 20 years. She's also an incredible communicator, and she is the founder of the Stress Illness Recovery Practitioners Association in the UK, which we're going to be talking about later in this interview. Georgie also wrote a fantastic book called Chronic Pain, Your Key to Recovery, which I warmly recommend to all of you if you have not yet read it. It's full of actionable and step-by-step -step instructions on how to get better from your stress illness. And Georgie's also given a whole bunch of talks, including TED Talks. So again, such an honor to have you here on The Steady Coach. In this interview, we talk about what stress illness means and what stress illness approaches look like when you're dealing with chronic pain and or chronic dizziness. Georgie shares exactly what she focuses on when she's helping someone recover, and she also explains how her methods have evolved over the years, especially since her publication of her book in 2014. I think you're going to learn a lot from this interview. We give lots of actionable advice, and Georgie also gives some tips on how to find practitioners who can help you, both if you're in the UK or anywhere else in the world because Serpa trains people worldwide. And if you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. Please leave them below. You can like this video. Please share it. Please subscribe to my channel. And if you're listening to this as a podcast, please consider following the podcast and leaving us a five-star review. All of these things help me reach more people, and that is my mission in creating all of this content, helping people who need this information to recover. Please enjoy this interview with Georgie. All right, Georgie. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Well, I'm excited to chat with you to hear some of your perspectives on what you in your work call stress illnesses. So mm -hmm. are you ready to dive right in? Absolutely. Okay. All right. So maybe we start at the beginning mm -hmm. and you can tell us a little bit about why you decided to start integrating this stress illness approach into your work. You're a physiotherapist to begin with. So Yes. So I am a physiotherapist. I worked in the National Health Service in the UK um, until 2005. And I left because I was becoming more and more interested in pain. Um, and was using some new training in different approaches like, like acupuncture uh, and other um, other approaches to help with pain. Um, but it was so difficult in the NHS because we didn't have much time. So I immediately started realizing that when people had more time, they were opening up more. Uh, I was starting to question more. I was getting better results. I was getting frustrated with the chronic pain uh, or chron chronic conditions where we're supposedly only able to help to manage the pain. Um, and I think I just started questioning. That's basically what was going on. I was having a lot of recurring or uh, different uh, pains that were coming and going and other symptoms coming and go going like gallbladder issues. Dizziness was one of them, I have to say. Um, and so various symptoms that when you look back, once you understand all this, then you start to realize I've been having this since I was about six years old, different symptoms. Um, but at the time, I think I was just questioning, for example, why somebody would come to me with a chronic condition they might have had for years and say that it started when they bent over to pick up a pen. And yet they were training in the gym and, and very healthy. Um, or they woke up in the morning and had pain, which I certainly did as well. Um, and then that pain persisted. Or they'd been told that they needed surgery for stenosis or a prolapsed disc, a um, slip disc. And yet with my very gentle treatments, they avoided surgery. And this was rattling my brain. <laughs> I really, with my physiotherapy biomedical model understanding on, I couldn't understand why. So I started questioning it more. 
Um, when I left the National Health Service and set up my own practice, I woke up one morning in agony with sciatica um, and had no clue why, because it, you know people blame it on the mattress or the pillow, as I did. But by then, I think I had started thinking, hang on, hang on that just doesn't make sense. Luckily, I went to see um, a practitioner who asked me one question I'd never asked before, which is, so what's going on in your life? And it was like, wow, okay, so I've left the National Health Service, I'm setting up my own business, my husband's self-employed, um, and I've suddenly got to make sure that I'm helping with the bills coming in as well. Uh, and so that literally with two or three appointments and this understanding, the pain just disappeared. And that made me really start questioning. I remember talking to her a lot about it, other colleagues, um, and spent the next few months just reading and reading. And that's when I came across Dr. Sama's um, book. The first one I read, I think, was The Mind Body Prescription. And I happened to read his book and uh, as I was about to go on a long journey. And I woke up in the morning before the journey and could hardly move my neck. Uh, but because I was reading the book and was halfway through, I realized exactly what it was. Um, but I didn't ha I hadn't finished the book, so it didn't tell me what I could do about it. <laughs> <laughs> but when things resolved after two or three days, the pain just eased. And that was such an amazing, I'm getting a tingle actually as I'm telling you this, it was just an amazing epiphany for me to really reinforce what I was reading and to fully accept it. And I began to see how that applied to so many patients. And then I started to uh, recommend his books within the practice. I got in touch with Dr. Sano and then eventually in November 2007 went over and visited him and shadowed him at work and went to his lectures and things. Um, and and that's and everything changed then. My whole my understanding for me and my health and well-being as well as the way I work. So still as a physiotherapist, but working within my scope of practice, doing something different, but still treating people with pain and other persistent health conditions. So that's how yes. it changed. <laughs> wow. You, you know, I a couple things came up while you were telling me that. Thank you for sharing all of that, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. The first is that I, I was telling someone the other day, you know, I'm – I'm not really practicing audiology and <laughs> what I do with my my clients is very different but as you but as you were talking and saying you know I am a physiotherapist I'm treating pain just in a different way I'm thinking well I'm still treating dizziness I'm just not using yeah. the tools that weren't working that that's yes. that's what's different yeah. so yeah yeah and even when I left the national health service I was using forms of alternative therapy, like a form of Bowen therapy, a form of reflex, reflex therapy in spinal pain and acupuncture. Those are my treatments. Uh, and yet I was still working as a physiotherapist, but just working in a different way, but still educating people and, um, and helping them get better. And that's really what we're wanting to do, isn't it? That's what it our is. professions are uh, training us to do. <laughs> it is, it is. And, and I think that's, was was so frustrating just like you I, I also was just so frustrated it's so frustrating to be a professional and see people who are dealing with conditions like these and not have tools so yeah. that's why what you've done since you've made this discovery is just so amazing and I'm so, that's why I'm so excited to talk about SERPA but I don't want to get ahead of myself <laughs> so <laughs> we're gonna get there we're gonna get there um so so bef again before we get into what you ended up doing the magnificent work you've done in helping way more people than you could have ever helped personally. Um, yeah. I was wondering if you could just explain how stress leads to symptoms. And those of you who are not new to my work, you're going to be somewhat familiar with this idea, but some of you may not be familiar with it. And also, we all explain it a little differently. So again, I was hoping you could give us your elevator pitch about it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I tend to try and keep things simple <laughs> because I do like to bring things down into things that being really simple. Um, and really, you know, stress is our body's way of responding to a threat. It's a protective response. And we need it. You know, we, we need it to be able to respond to everything that's happening in our lives, um, to prepare us uh, and to make sure that we're not hurt in any way. Uh, for example, even just um, somebody excuse me, pulling in front of you when you're in a car, being able to put your foot down on the brake. 
as a quick response, that's a stress response. So it's good for us. It helps us stay alert and uh, prepare for um, be able to provide a pre presentation, for example. You know, if there's an element of stress, it's just sort of honing you and, and getting you prepared to, uh, to deliver. It's when it becomes chronic that it becomes a problem. Um, and in the world, well, in, in primal days, then obviously we know that you know, saber-toothed tigers were around and the primal fight or flight was response, response was actually protecting us from basically being killed by a saber-toothed tiger. Um, there are not many tigers and certainly not saber-toothed tigers around these days and certainly not often that many life-threatening situations. Uh, but unlike animals, we do have this part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, where we overthink, we analyze, we um, we create so much of our own self-induced stress. So there might be, as we know from stress and from the trauma experts, stress and trauma are not what's happening. The stress actually is a stressor, what's happening to us, and trauma, what's happening to us. The most important thing is how we are responding to that. And if we're then using all this to overthink things and catastrophize and worry, then we're creating an awful lot more self-induced stress, stress. And that can then, if it becomes chronic, you know, acute's great. But if it's constantly, uh, I don't know, having uh, every, not necessarily even every day, but frequently in your life, feeling stressed by something, and then becoming, you maybe your habitual behavior is to worry about something, um, or catastrophize, then we become much more sensitized. Um, and the effect of long-term stress, when things really aren't able to calm down, because you, if you were chased by a saber-toothed tiger and uh, escape, then basically you'd be calming down, you'd go back to you know, deer, if they're chased by a tiger, we'll go and uh, graze on the grass again and calm down. It won't be in his head thinking, oh, thank goodness, my baby wasn't with me, and <laughs> right. whatever we do. <laughs> yes. Whereas we tend to, don't we? And so a lot of our stress is self-induced due to the beliefs we built up um, growing up, our learned behaviours, our personality traits that have adapted over the years as well. And chronic um, stress can then result in all sorts of issues from, you know, uh, reduced um, immune system, uh, poor reproduction. Uh, it can end up with cardiac problems, strokes, as well as chronic pain and dizziness and all these other symptoms, fatigue. Um, and so there's, a, you know, there's a, so many things that can happen, but it's more about the chronic stress uh, and how we deal with it. Uh, so the chronic stress in our bodies that can then just yes. manifest as symptoms. Well, you made two really important points that I want to highlight. The first, uh, so I've, I've come up with not a new metaphor, but a new thing that I say to everyone. So now I'm going to say it here. Um, you're with yourself all the time. You're with yourself 24 hours a day. So if the stress yes. is coming from you, you are under chronic stress. So yes. um, one misconception I think people have is when they hear stress illness, they say, okay, well then I've got to de-stress. I've got to like not have stress in my life. And as bad as your boss may be, or the traffic may be, or your children may be, the only person who is really with you 24 hours a day and is a constant source mm -hmm. of stress is you. Yes. So uh, again, this isn't a blame thing. This is an agency thing because it means you have the power to act because you can't change your boss or necessarily your children or the traffic, but yeah. you can change how you respond. Um, and, and to me, that's a message of empowerment. So absolutely, really want to highlight that. Yeah, yes, definitely. Yes. And then the second thing I want to highlight and maybe ask for further information on, so you you pointed out that stress causes all sorts of, can ca all, cause all sorts of physical breakdown in our bodies. Mm -hmm. In the case of chronic pain and chronic dizziness, there's no, ne there's ne not necessarily any kind of physical breakdown. So how do you explain um, how stress causes people to have symptoms? You mentioned something about sensitization. So maybe you could say a little bit more about what that means. Uh, well, sensitization is when our body becomes sensitized, so it's more easily triggered. Um, and I think the important thing about something like pain is that there's never been any evidence to link pain with injury. So pain is a protective response. It's actually 
a subjective perception of our brain. So in the past, the understanding of um, pain was that we'd stab our toe on a nail and the, the pain pathway would send the message up to the brain saying there's pain, but that's not actually the case. OK, so actually what, what happens is that there's data that comes up if you step on something or when something's hurt or whatever, uh, you hurt something somehow. Um, but actually, that's how your brain then perceives it. So it actually decides, well, have you experienced this before? Is it dangerous? Is it something we need to avoid? Uh, so it takes on that sensory input, but it also looks at what are your beliefs around pain? Uh, what are the cultural beliefs around pain? Um, and uh, and your own experiences and have you expect what have you experienced in the past so that absolutely is why pain um, how we actually perceive pain but then the what we find with chronic pain is that there are a number of things that they found that cause pain to persist and it's nothing to do with how severe the spinal degeneration is let's say or how severe the injury it's actually have you experienced past trauma have you, um, what are your beliefs around the pain persisting? If you've got poor, fearful beliefs about pain persisting, your pain's more likely to persist. Did you have uh, anxiety or depression, you know, around the time of the injury? All those things are actually far more relevant than anything else, because as we know, um, there are some people that can have pain that have no um, injury, and there are some people, and, and an example of this, of the, the opposite is, my son, um, I think it was about three years ago, was kite surfing, which he absolutely loves. And so many of his friends have damaged their knees and things before. And he was kite surfing and he actually got the wind wrong and he landed from a very high height down to the water, um, but didn't think anything of it, got his board and got the kite ready again and tried to climb on the board. He couldn't climb on, his knee kept giving way. So he was realized, oh, now it's my turn, I've damaged my knee. Um, and he had to have help to get to to accidents and emergency, basically. So he had people there who were able to look after his things. Um, and basically, he had no pain, and yet he had fractured his knee. Wow. So he'd actually fractured it, but there was no fear, no, oh, it's my turn. He was just thinking, well, it's my turn. He had no pain until after surgery. And what we found fascinating was after surgery, when he, he was at home, uh, the time when his pain was the most extreme was, and most of the time he was okay, um, but the time when he needed the stronger medication was when he was worrying about work because it was a new job and he had the sound wow. and things like that. What a story. Yeah, so powerful. And yet somebody else I know had exactly the same injury. And when I told her that um, what had happened, she said, oh, that's such a painful injury. And I realized her situation was completely different. She is more of a warrior. But also, she um, had just had a new baby. So she was in hospital, trying to keep the baby with her and feed the baby um, with this same fracture. And, and so she was in extreme pain. So wow. just those, it just shows that there's no link between pain and the amount of tissue damage that there is. Wow. Oh, this is raising so many things for me. But the way I'm going to go with this is to remark on why... It is therefore so important that medical professionals know how to work with people who are coming in with an acute symptom. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where so much chronic dizziness comes from because mm -hmm. peop often people have dizziness because to begin with because there's something physically wrong, something mm -hmm. happened, and then they're shunted from doctor to doctor. No one knows what's wrong. They go online. They read the horror stories. They go to various organization websites and all they talk about is management and it's chronic and you're never going to get better. And again, um, not everyone has this experience, but a lot of people do. And then the fear starts to build up and no one understands. They look normal on the outside. Yeah. And it you can, you can just see how this directly, just in the same parallel way that you just described, leads to to two potential people having exactly the same problem and exactly the same symptoms to begin with, perhaps even, and then taking two completely different trajectories. So yes. that leads me to, I think, a very important question. You're describing a well understood aspect of neuroscience. We, we know this. We know this. Physiotherapists are trained in a biopsychosocial model. Doctors are trained in it. We know this. 
why is this type of inquiry not more widely practiced? Why are people not implementing this with clients or patients? I think even just that term biopsychosocial, um, that changed only something, was it about 15 years ago um, that became biopsychosocial? And I think the psycho side was really about recognizing, because there's a lot of evidence for this, that fear makes symptoms worse, catastrophizing does, ruminating. Um, but it's really got, according to the biopsychosocial understanding, it's not got anything to do with emotions or past trauma or unresolved emotions. And I think that's the problem. And then the difficulty then is that um, so often when people hear us talking about emotions and trauma, they think, oh, well, this is psychotherapy. You know, it's not in our scope of practice, these are the, pr the practitioners. Um, whereas actually we're working on the physiological changes in the body. We're not doing using talk therapy, although having said that within circle, we train psychotherapists who might well include that. Sure. But on the whole, we're mentoring, we're coaching, we're educating um, and helping them recognize the triggers and what are the unconscious patterns often maybe they can't spot themselves. Um, and I think that's the problem. And, and I face this with uh, physiotherapists in the country um, who are, and psychotherapists, psychotherapists th feeling threatened because they feel we're trying to take over their role. Uh, and physical therapists uh, feeling threatened because it seems like we're going into the you know, it's talk therapy world and we shouldn't be doing that and that's scary because we don't do that. Whereas right. actually we're educating, we're mentoring, we're teaching. Right. Because, you're, <laughs> because your patient is just an elbow or just a knee. I mean, that, oh, yeah, again, sure. it's just so absurd from our, I'm sure you share this perspective. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's so absurd that we would slice and dice the body yeah. up into small portions and then say, okay, it's gotta be from neck down Whatever's going on up here doesn't matter. Whatever's going on with your emotions, whatever has happened to you in the past doesn't matter. We're looking at your elbow. It's just, yeah. and, and I think you're right. Uh, the biopsychosocial uh, model, the, the implication is that we're dealing with three separate systems that all kind of mm -hmm. talk to each other. It's really all one system. You're, you come with your so social background. You come with your entire psychological history and not not the not psychiatric history not like mental illness but you no, come with your your history of of how you were cared for when you were a child and what life was like growing up and what life is like right now you're coming with that and that that there yeah. is no separating that from how physical symptoms show up no and i remember when i worked in the national health service and a patient would come with shoulder pain and then one day they'd come in and say oh my back's really hurting and we had to say, you've got to go back to your doctor and get re-referred for your back. And it just never made sense. It seemed like a waste of money apart from anything else. But no wonder everything, people are struggling to bring every, the body and the, their world, people's world together again, when it's been split up into so many different specialisms. Yes. Crazy. So, yes. So, okay. So you mentioned three things. Let's see if I can, if I can recall them. So one factor is that that psychosocial may not capture emotional history and unconscious beliefs and yeah. tra traumatic patterns that are still being brought up. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that's one component. The other is people are worried about not maybe not operating in their scope of practice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then also this idea, the last thing that you said slice and dice that yeah. I was that I was talking about. Yeah. And, so, and I also think that actually you know, one of the things this is highlighted to me by Dr. Brian Broom in New Zealand, uh, the importance of anybody doing something a bit different to not use the theory of every uh, of anything. That was, that's it. I wrote it down actually. Where did I write it down? Um, uh, the theory, yes, the theory of everything. Mm -hmm. So in other words, not just for us not to go out there to other health professionals saying, oh, this, this is the answer to all the problems, all the chronic pain problems, all the chronic dizziness problems, this is the answer, because that puts people off. So I think we can get people's backs up if we don't accept that this, don't really share that what we're doing is actually an, um, an all body medicine, all, you know, we're looking at everything basically, um, a whole person approach 
the whole person dependent on what that individual has gone through, their past their, and their present and the future, if they're worrying about the future. Um, and I think that is, is a point that we need to be cautious of, that we are not putting it out there for people to believe that what we're doing is, is the only way. And that we have, because as we know, we need to make sure that everything more serious has been ruled out. Sure. Um, and that we, you know, looking at diet and exercise and everything, it's not just, we're not just working on mind and body. And I think that's probably an important thing for people to recognize. Sure, sure. And I mean, it would be, it'd be funny if we were dogmatic about not being dogmatic about <laughs> the biomedical approach. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I, I, I think in many cases, when we ask the question, what was going on in your life when everything started, mm. we're the first person, we're the first person to actually ask that question. Yes. And to me, that seems like that should be such a mainstream approach. There, there, that's not really about right or wrong, or like we have to do it this way or that way. Maybe we don't, maybe someone doesn't need to go down the path of processing emotions if that doesn't resonate. But the idea that you are a whole person with a whole history and that that affects yeah. your current experience, I think it is as, should be as mainstream as it gets. Absolutely. And that's a question anybody can ask. You know, and I think it's sad that uh, certainly as a physiotherapist, uh, I mean, I've been working what, 40 odd years now. Um, up until 2007, I never asked that question. I wasn't aware it was relevant. So all those decades of me year learning, uh, working as a physiotherapist up to that point, uh, I was not aware of it. I was not aware of it personally. So that when I work out, of, I woke up out, um, and got out of bed and developed sciatica, I had no awareness at all that it could possibly be anything but something physically going on. And and it's like you know we we just are uh, focused on what we know, what we understand. So the I think this is just as much about uh, raising awareness within the public as it is to uh, the medical world as well. But, well, that is exactly why we're doing this interview. Absolutely. So well, and it's a lot of the work that you do at SERPA. So you are the head of the Stress Illness Recovery Practitioners Association. Mm -hmm. And I, I think from that position, you may have a little bit of an eagle's eye view of what some of the trends are. So I'm just curious to know, from your perspective, are things changing? Are more people opening up to this approach, both on the practitioner side and on the client side mm. or the, 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 the side of the people who are suffering from this? I, I would say so. I mean, I started this in 2007. So we're now 16 years in. Uh, yes. And there's definitely been a shift. Uh, I mean, I remember the first time I went to or having seen Dr. Sano in 2007, going back in 2009 for the first conference or gathering of people in this field, including, including people like Howard Schubiner, Dave Clark and Anne Gordon. Um, and it, you know, it was that's when we all started looking at okay, how can we move forward? How can we get this out there? Um, and I think it's just that we all would say now there's a shift. There's a definite shift. It's been helped on the pain side by this greater understanding of why uh, chronic pain, of what happens with chronic pain, um, why it persists, why pain persists. And then with some of the evidence, uh, the studies that have been done within our field as well, um, to show that actually, yes, we can help people not just manage the pain, but resolve it. Uh, the work by um, uh, Lorimer Mosley, for example, a physiotherapist who's also a scientist, a neuroscientist in Australia. Um, I think, you know, he's really got a lot more, uh, his work has changed dramatically over the 15 years for us to really have a much better understanding maybe not quite yet with the linking it with the trauma but certainly all this understanding about neural pathways that become learned and then um, sensitized uh, has really helped with the understanding and that because that's been taken over by um, the medical world as well that's gradually more and more understanding and certainly within in the physiotherapy um, world um, much more. Uh, Peter Sullivan, for example, is another physio who works in Australia and who's also a scientist. He comes over to the UK, as does Lorimer, runs courses. So their, their work is much more, um, uh, what's, the, what's the word, uh, very much accepted now, which makes it easier to make that little bit more of a step 
when sure. we say we're looking at the um, evidence around trauma as well. Sure. Well, uh, and I so you may not have an opinion on this, but from my perspective, I I, I see this too shifting when it comes to pain. I do mm. not see it shifting when it comes to dizziness and some other symptoms. Mm. Um, I think dizziness is far behind. I have all sorts of theories about that. I think pain is more common. I think it also yeah. is associated with, unfortunately, the opioid crisis. So we are we are dealing with a lot of of difficulties surrounding mm -hmm. pain. So I think there's more there's more funding or more interest. But it seems that I mean the studies that I I've, I've seen on this. There are studies that look into this, thing, but they're they're looking at pre existing psychiatric conditions, and that's as you and I know. While absolutely, if someone has generalized anxiety disorder, of course, it's more likely that that person might develop a chronic physical symptom, but that is not the kinds of risk factors that you and I are looking at. No. Um, <laughs> yeah. And many of these people that I see are, are never had a psychiatric issue in their entire lives. They were never anxious. They were no. perfectly happy, healthy people. And then they got hit with this. And mm -hmm. it's really only through a process of some excavation that we start to understand the kind of stress they were under prior to the illness that leads to this chronic cycle and how normal it is and how normal it is how normal it is and it's not all about trauma you know it's so many people say oh i haven't had any trauma in my past but who's gone through their childhood without feeling unsupported at some point um or maybe having pressure on for exams or sibling rivalry this what they call the small t's but that's normal What's the book by Gabo Mate, Dr. Gabo Mate? The, the, myth, the of myth of normal. normal. Mm -hmm. Just because it's normal doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in your book, your book is it's been out for almost 10 years. Can you believe that? I know. And, and for the last <laughs> probably four or five years, I've been wanting to update it. I just right. haven't, done it. I haven't got around to it. Well, your book is fantastic. And it's, it's, it's a gem. And for some reason people outside of the UK are less familiar with it. So just a note to the audience, I will put a link to the book in the description if you have not read it yet. It's wonderful and very detailed. And that's that's Thank one you. of the things I really wanted to go into some depth with you about today because in your book, you really, you outline step-by-step step how to do all sorts of things. You, you talk to people about how to do journaling and affirmations and how to do mm -hmm. some emotional processing. So again, really a... a, a a comprehensive self-help guide, but it has been almost 10 years. And I know your practice has evolved since then. So I'm wondering what's changed since you wrote the book. Yeah. Well, I think initially the reason I put so much information in about strategies was that I couldn't find a book or many books that really did explain, well, what to do. Yes. Uh, so I wanted to do that. Um, but yes, things have changed. And as I said, uh, you know, I have really wanted to um, update it. And one of these days I will write an, another edition. Um, and in fact, some of the updated, um, uh, I, I wrote a chapter in the, um, gosh, what's that? I put it here actually, um, oh yes, psychophysiologic disorders that a group of us wrote. So I wrote a chapter in there, which is actually a bit more updated, but it's, even that's three years or so ago. Yes. The, the, the research certainly has evolved. Yes. Hugely. I'm just, I'm just wondering, I mean, from from a client perspective or from the perspective of people listening here, mm. what what key changes have you made to the way that you might advise a person to get better? I think, I think apart from the education side and uh, helping them make connect, join the dots basically, I think now the main thing that I, I focus on is getting people out of their heads and into their bodies because that so many people come to me and they're desperately trying to fix things or they're really, really fearful or they're fighting the pain. And it's like, a, and it's that you start listening to the words they say and what they write in emails. I'm fighting this battle. I'm determined to beat it. And I'm going, oh, yes. that's completely the wrong way to go about this. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. teaching them why that actually is just fueling the neural pathways. Um, and and then actually encouraging them and teaching them how to become more emotionally aware because it's incredibly fascinating how poor we are generally in the Western world at actually feeling how we're feeling, noticing how we're feeling. 
And one of these things, the things that I will do is at the beginning of a session, just say to somebody, um, you know, if you close your eyes and think about somebody you love, what are you aware of in your body? Um, and often nothing, mm. nothing, which those people who are emotion, very emotionally aware find that difficult to understand. But we're so focused on doing, 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 and busy, 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 that we don't stop often to just pause and just start noticing what's going on in here. Um, and we're blinkered to that unless we're aware of it. But the, we're so focused on the pain that we then don't even know that there's anything else going on. So the more we can move the focus away from the pain to how we're feeling, the better. Um, the other thing I do if I get somebody to ask about, uh, you know, think about somebody they love or something that's um, exciting that's happened, whether they're aware of it or not, I then move and to say, well, uh, you know, when you bring your dad to mind or your something that maybe is not sort of worked quite so well in their life nothing really traumatic to begin with obviously um you know what are you aware of and again th quite often there's nothing there so sometimes it can take quite some time to build this what we call it the felt sense or the interoception mm -hmm. and that to me is the most important part of all this now because the pain or the dizziness is because we've ignored these sensations we've not been aware of the sensations and they built up and built up and rather than falling apart then we end up with a manifestation of a symptom of some sort mm -hmm. so i think the biggest thing for me is uh, using emotional awareness to develop the felt sense and then also teaching um grounding self-soothing and teaching them to um feel safe and building their uh, capacity to allow emotions to come up and settle down because actually if we do allow that I think um what is it in one of the TED talks and one of the studies they talk about it takes 90 seconds for an emotion if we let it flow to just come up and go but what we tend to do is react to the sensations we're feeling and then just tighten up and we don't allow it to because it's, right. it's fearful so we go into fight or flight so the more they can learn that and preferably before they start journaling about anything uncomfortable the more they can learn to feel safe in the body when an emotion comes up, that the more they practice that, then they can often not only are, are they able to sort of ease the pain or symptom, but actually they can uh, prevent it. If they're tuned into their feelings, then once they've been triggered emotionally, if they deal with it straight away, they not, might not get the symptom. So you're, you're mentioning two potential contributors to what we called stress at the beginning of this interview. So the emotion itself can, you know, can produce this stress. And then the, the defensive strategies that we use to try to keep the emotions down can produce stress. Then yeah. of course there's more to it than that, but, but mm. that's, that's a primary source of stress that we called internal stress at the beginning of the interview as well. So yeah. When I was saying, you know, you're with yourself 24 hours a day, you're also having feelings a lot. Um, yes. and if you're not feeling any of them, that's a lot of stress that has nothing to necessarily do with the amount of stress you're in uh, from the outside. No, absolutely. And we might be so, well, what does we talk about, you know, authenticity? We might be have learned so much to sort of hide who we are because we're trying to fit into the cultural expectations or the family expectations and we um and these personality traits that we develop, you know, it's like people pleasing, caregiving, you know, take those away. If we don't do that, we're doing it with fear rather than love, because actually if we don't do that, we are really fearful of what people will think of us. And so working on our beliefs, I feel, is really, really important as well. Yes. You brought up an excellent point about this, though, that really journaling, although I certainly use journaling with people as a tool, as, as do you, um, if we're just going around in analytical circles and we're not really processing feelings, as you discussed just a few moments ago, then we're 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 still we're still here and we're not necessarily resolving the stress we're just kind of dancing circles around the stress yes yeah so it seems like what you're saying and please correct me if i'm wrong but it seems like what you're saying is if people can work on this emotional awareness mindfulness component first it's going to make the journaling much more effective when they actually do go and look at the stressful situations that they think they need to work on 
I think especially if there is some really uncomfortable stuff that they will procrastinate over or, you know, really scary stuff that they don't want to go there, then often, obviously, if it's traumatic, uh, significantly traumatic, then it can help to actually work with somebody who is trained in this field who's uh, profession is a psychotherapist or a counsellor um, but often people I see have been there done it had years of psychotherapy or counselling um, and they've talked about things but they're still not they're still very good at distracting themselves through being busy or you know still using all the coping strategies they have um, and so actually the journaling can be great um, uh, at, at acknowledging expressing rationalizing um, but usually these days, especially if I'm doing an assessment with somebody, if I'm assessing someone and we touch on something that's quite traumatic, I would rather have taught them at the beginning how to self-soothe, how to feel, allow it to be there. That's great. You triggered it. Look what you're aware of. Notice what's going on. Ground yourself. Calm, heartfelt breathing. Because if you do breathing and f focus on what's going, imagining the air going around your heart, you're not in your head going, oh, my God, oh, my God, what, what's going on here? Right. Um, so then when during the assessment, for example, if I then would ask somebody uh, about something that might be triggering for them, as soon as I would become aware of them, you know, the color change or them tightening up or uh, shifting in the seat or going like this, then I would go, OK, what's happening at the moment? Just lower your gaze or close your eyes, calm your breathing down, ground yourself, notice it, allow it to be there. Don't fight it. Be curious. So this is where somatic tracking comes in. I was in just well. about to say, somatic yeah. tracking, exactly. Yeah. That's all part of this emotional awareness. I think it, the emotional awareness is just any emotion. Um, I, I, I think I mentioned this when we spoke uh, a few weeks ago, um, when I had a period of dizziness. Now, in the past, I know I used to um, feel slightly dizzy when I was in a, a supermarket and I was um put taking things out of the trolley and moving them across and i was doing yes. that so i used to be have to be careful and do that we have a particularly uh steep uh, um coming off our ring road in our town where it's literally 360 degrees and i used to have to go carefully because i get dizzy then now that resolved without me working on it but just resolved when i started working on me because again, it's not about trying to get rid of symptoms, it's working on us so we don't need the symptoms. And this was a few months ago, and I was working at my computer, and I can't now remember exactly what was going on, but I was probably working on the training for SERP or something and other stuff going on. Um, and I didn't walk the talk, and I clearly ignored the feelings initially, because, and then I thought I started noticing, okay, something's coming up, I need to take a break. But when I stood up, I suddenly, the, the room spun, um, and I had to literally hold on and crawl. I've got a sofa over there, oh, crawl to the sofa and hold on to the handle, to the arms, to stop myself from doing it. Now, at the time, I couldn't have journaled anyway. So what I did was I just closed my eyes, focused on my heart, imagined the, the air going around my heart, and then I started just noticing what was going on and also reassuring myself. So noticing the sensations in my body rather than what was going on in my head and then reassuring myself and giving messages of safety. And I think it took probably three or four minutes um, for everything to just calm down. Now, I didn't go back to the computer and start working again. I took a break <laughs> sure. and then explored it further. But that then was able to resolve those symptoms. So, you know, it's just about getting out of the head then and then into the body and then allowing yourself to feel the emotions that when unresolved were manifesting in the dizziness. And the skills that you just described are skills that are built. It takes time to build yes. those skills. And so yeah. I think that's another area where people sometimes get very frustrated. Well, you said if I breathe, then my symptoms would go away in three months. <laughs> uh, that's Georgie has been doing this for a while. Um, so you know, and, and I, also, can I just say that, that yes. you, exactly what you said there, my symptoms will go away. If you are doing breath work or emotional awareness to try and get rid of your symptoms, there's the wrong emphasis there. The yes. focus is on the symptoms. For me, I wasn't even thinking about that. Once I'd sat down and I just focused on how I was feeling, then, then things calmed down. And what a self-compassionate approach. 
that that's what's that's, coming to mind as I think of this. I think of you in this situation like a loving parent to yourself. Like you were like, yeah. oh, you're you're scared. Hey, I'm with you. I've got yeah. you. What do you need to tell me? Slow oh, down. Sure, that's virtually exactly what I was saying. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And this doesn't this this doesn't come naturally to people because they're used to treating themselves like I I mean the not not a kind parent <laughs> I don't know exactly what it is but some kind of combination you know uh, you know work foreman and and maybe uh, you know a, a a really mean coach or something I don't know exactly yeah. what they're channeling but it's not a warm loving parent no. um, and that takes skill it takes time to build habits around that. And, and as you say, I tell people, your large umbrella goal, we know the reason you're doing, I know you want to feel better. Okay. We, we can, yeah. we can have oh. that in the room that can be in the room. But if that's what's, if that's the, I've got to do this. So I'm going to get better. It is going to backfire spectacularly. That is not creating safety for you. In fact, it's creating more fear of the symptoms. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so what I'm hearing then is as it, it if someone does, decide to read your book to add on some of these somatic practices, somatic tracking, trying to get out of, of your head into your body, feeling your emotions in your body, uh, building this loving parenting relationship with yourself. Yeah. And uh, we, I have a YouTube channel in my name, actually, not Serpers. Um, and that has an emotional awareness practice. It has a grounding Wonderful. practice. It's got uh, one that I think I just called pause, breathe, feel, reassure, which is what I did when I started feeling dizzy. Just pause. Mm, beautiful. Calm your breathing. Notice how you're feeling. And then just reassuring myself. So that's exactly what I did. So there's a recording of that as well um, and grounding. So. I'll, I'll link to that in the video description so people can access it. Yeah, Thank you. that's wonderful. Wow. Okay. So anything else you want to share that's changed about your current practices that people should know, little tools or updates that you've picked up over time? Um, I think those are the main ones. And as you said, self-compassion, just real self-compassion. And, and I think probably more recently, really working on beliefs, looking at the beliefs. So in other words, if, if your tendency is to be a people pleaser, explore that. You know, where did you, why did you learn that? If you're not a people pleaser, what are you fearful of? And if, and then looking at the belief that's under that. And the more we can start processing these, these faulty beliefs, um, then the more we can start ch more easily changing our behaviors as well. Oh, absolutely. I, I call them emotional learnings, mm. um, emotional mm. learnings. So they're stored out of our conscious awareness and they, they're like kind of like master instructions that, yes. that, yeah. that the brain's always following. Yeah. So like, if I let people down, I am worthless. So yes. then of course you're going to be a people pleaser. Of course you're going to be a perfectionist. So yeah. Of course you're never going to say no. So we can work on those things, but actually if we go to the instruction manual and look at that instead, we, right. we have change becomes more effortless it doesn't it's not a conscious constant battle to try to change your habits no absolutely yeah. and it's tough sure you know, it's absolutely. tough doing that but well worth it definitely yes definitely wow mm. thank you and thank you for for all of these really useful tips i think that you just gave uh people watching or listening to this so yeah, yeah so what is next for serpa like what are the main things that you're excited about for SERPA right now? I think the main thing is that we've had, we moved the training online in 2018. And as we oh, know- Good timing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, goodness. oh my goodness. <laughs> yes, perfect timing. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and all my work personally, you know, clinically was online as well. So the perfect timing before wow. yes. the pandemic all started. Um, and uh and but it's now five six years old so i mean we've been updating it bit by bit but we're limited because we are uh, do have a, a regulated by the cpd certification um so we're complying completely updating it all now with support from my membership board as well um and so hopefully by spring next year we will have an updated uh and, and completely revamping it um, wow so training for our practitioners we revamped the online recovery program for the public last year 
And that was great because we've got a whole load of our experienced practitioners who have done sections of that. Which wow. Is Wonderful. Um, and the other thing that we just started to talk about now, we had a conference last year in 2022. And of course, we had people like Carol Schubiner and uh, David Hanscom, Dave Clark over. Um, and we are now starting with talks about potentially having one in the spring of 2025. Excellent. It's time to organize them. So uh, yes. giving ourselves time. <laughs> well, I was hoping you would say we've added dizziness to all of our all of our materials. So maybe <laughs> maybe put that on the roadmap as well. It, it is on the website. It's Excellent. on the website on the victim. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. You know, I didn't explicitly ask, so I should explicitly ask. Georgie, do, does everything that we talked about today apply to chronic dizziness as well? Yes, it does. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it does. <laughs> and we often have patients who have pain as well as dizziness, or we'll have people who come with no pain and they just come with dizziness or another condition. And, and as we know, stress impacts the men our mental health as well. So we you know it depends on what people's background is as to you know what their profession is but sure we get all the whole array of symptoms that people present with uh, tinnitus is another one that's very common yes um, yes so, yeah, absolutely yes. thank you I, again I, i've explicitly asked now i, I <laughs> couldn't couldn't let you go without doing that <laughs> well and that that brings me to kind of on the topic of SERPA and the practitioner training. So some folks here on my channel, I, I provide a lot of education for free. They they may have been exposed to some of your work. They may have tried journaling and somatic tracking, and sometimes they just feel like they're not getting anywhere. And mm -hmm. I find especially now, of course, I'm not making blanket statements about any particular symptom, but dizziness can be particularly distressing and dysregulating for people. So mm -hmm. sometimes people need help. And I was wondering if you might have any ideas about how someone might go about selecting a practitioner. Now, you may want to say a word about how SERPA trains practitioners, because that's very, I mean, it's very rigorous, but also mm -hmm. how someone might look at the SERPA directory and, and be able to find someone that might actually be able to help him or her with those particular symptoms. Yes, yeah. Well, all the SERPA practitioners, all those who've uh, come and done the SERPA training, <clears throat> and there are currently two levels, there are actually going to be three levels, um, because I feel it's really important for practitioners to go through their own um, process, go through the online recovery program, basically, themselves. Um, so uh, they need to be a health professional or a coach they need to be uh, so they need to be qualified obviously and be regulated by their uh, national or international regulatory body so to make sure they're working according to how their profession should work and keep up to date and everything um, as well as being sure to work with patients um, we have a directory where each practitioner that i mean we've trained hundreds of people so the the people that we promote on our website are the ones who are current members and the reason we do that is that obviously that it's a benefit for them being a member, but it also means we know that they are up to date with their what we call continual professional development in America. I can't remember what you call it. Continuing education. Continuing or education yeah. Sort of yeah. Um, so um, uh, so we know that the, or everybody listed on our website um, has either just finished the training and is uh, trained or they're a SERPA practitioner, in which case they've done additional case studies and clinical supervision, um, but they are all uh, in our monthly membership. So, uh, and they, if the choice is theirs, whether they want to be listed or, listed or not. Most are in the UK, but we do have people in Australia, practitioners in Australia, America, and, and Europe as well. Um, we've uh, updated the directory a, good, a few years ago now because I really wanted to have people's photos on there because we do take, you know, we, we respond to what we see as well as what we read. Um, so they all have an explanation about themselves. They have a link to their own website. Um, they've obviously got their own photo as well. And so I think it, then it's about looking at um, do you have you had a particularly traumatic uh, experience? Would you prefer to see somebody whose uh, background is psychotherapy or counselling? In which case you can shortlist them to to those. 
um, would you prefer, would you like to be a case study, in which case you could work with somebody for reduced cost um, who's working on their case studies, anonymous case study. Um, uh, and and you can just look and see what experience people have. Uh, so there are SERPA trained. So these are the ones that just followed the online training themselves, done some of the assignments, all the assignments there. Um, and there are others who've done the additional case studies with um, supervision, supervision. So obviously they will have a bit more experience. Mm -hmm. um, and then alternatively, if somebody is you know really unsure, but they specifically want um, someone who can help in a certain way, then it's always worth just emailing at the office and then I can have a look at it sure. um, and, you know, and respond and just maybe recommend somebody or a few people. Good to know. Okay. Okay. That's good to know that people have that option. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, again, I know we only have a, a couple minutes left, but I was hoping you could say a word about what what that process might look like seeing a provider like what do what do these sessions look like and i know you can't speak for everyone but mm -hmm. what's what's different about this from going to just regular therapy or going to see your medical doctor about your pain or your other symptoms your dizziness right well we we do quite an in-depth assessment um and it depends really when we would use that because if so, let's say there's a physio physiotherapist and they have a patient coming to them with a physical problem and then they go into this um, or that it's mentioned it depends whether they're ready for it or not so everybody's it depends on the practitioner it depends on the client if somebody specifically is wanting to uh, work with somebody first of all uh, almost every practitioner offers offers a discovery call so a free discovery call uh, between 15 to 30 minutes and this is, gives an opportunity for them to meet the person because again that's really important it, it helps the to see whether the practitioner and the client um, uh, are a good fit together. Uh, so, and to also ask, ask any questions that they've got. And sometimes I suggest, you know, call two or three, because then you can get a good idea as to whether who you feel is right for you. Um, we do have, as I said, this in-depth uh, assessment. So often what will happen if somebody's coming specifically for this is that there will be sent a pre-assessment form beforehand. And um, so unlike, let's say, a patient going to a physiotherapist who will just turn up and then be examined physically, um, certainly when I started, I would examine them physically and then I would start um, questioning them about what was going on in their life. And, oh, so you woke up in the morning and I'm trying to get them to question their understanding. And then I would observe and see what, uh, whether they were ready or, or not. Um, so if somebody is ready and they decided they want a full assessment it, again it does depend some people do if they're doctors maybe don't have as much time they might split it up to i would normally have done uh, sometimes 90 to 120 minutes mm -hmm. um, whereas some people will have half hour sessions or an hour usually if it's an assessment at least an hour um, but it might be that they then need to do a little bit more after that but in that hour they would then go through the pre-assessments um, and start helping the individual connect the dots, um, explore what might be have been holding them back. Um, for many people, it is because they're very much in their heads and trying to work things out and understand it and trying, trying and fighting and trying to fix it and fearful of everything. Um, so that often is the case. And also it can help to work with a practitioner. You'll realize this because I'm who I am and I'm very unaware of a lot that's going on in here. Yeah. So by me working with someone else who's reflecting things back to me and questioning me, then I start to gain insights more. Um, yes. And I certainly have worked with people um, for myself. And so just like if you were going to go to a counsellor, this is about actually seeing somebody who can help reflect back and see what are your unconscious patterns and triggers you might not be aware of. Because often people will say, well, I, I don't know what the triggers are. Yes. Um, the more emotional awareness they have and the more they can start to notice when there's a tight, slight tightening maybe or whatever, they can begin to start recognizing what's going on. But often having somebody reflecting things back to you and talking through what might have happened can be who really understands can really help. Yes. And someone who's reflecting things back also knowing what patterns to look for. And yes. I think that's where mm -hmm. things can get really tricky when people 
so here in the United States, you know, we have the PPD Association, the Psychophysiologic mm -hmm. Disorders Association, but there aren't enough providers to go around. So people mm -hmm. sometimes will choose to go to see a, a local therapist or insu for insurance reasons, they have to see a local therapist. And mm -hmm. that therapist may be incredibly gifted at, at tracking mm -hmm. someone's experiences and helping that person challenge beliefs. But if, if that person isn't trained in mind-body disorders or stress illnesses specifically, that person may just not know what patterns to look for yeah, uh, because they're pretty, I mean, they're, they're pretty specific. They're pretty specific often to, to stress illnesses. So just, yeah. it's nice. It's very, very helpful to see someone who is, is specifically trained in mind body disorders. Yeah. And to feel so reassured that somebody understands. <laughs> yes. Yes. And who's yeah. seen people just like you get better. Yes. I mean, yeah. that's also a huge, yeah. a huge safety signal as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you. This has been just a delight. I'm so, so grateful to you for agreeing to come on my channel and chat with oh, me about this. I, I know I have a, a, a large audience in the UK and in Europe. So I'm hoping that by bringing you on, more people are going to become aware of SERPA's work. Mm -hmm. I think uh, many times people think they have to work with someone based in the U U.S., but that is not true. Uh, people mm -hmm. who are SERPA trained really are qualified to work with chronic dizziness. Yeah. So, and, and you have uh, done one of our CBD webinars for them as well. So That's right. Can, can yes. Make, all of them, even new ones, can be watching that and learning from you, which is wonderful. Yes, yes. So exactly. I personally have given lectures to the people who are SERPA trained. <laughs> so, <Yes. laughs> wonderful. And, and you'll be talking soon to more of the public within That's our right. as well, which is wonderful. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Great we're we're going to have a Facebook event. So, and, mm -hmm. and if people want to attend that, uh, if I link the public Facebook, yes, uh, SERPA Facebook, Facebook page, page. Yeah. Okay. I'll link that in the in the description of the video or podcast as well, so you can Lovely. follow the page and and um, come see me when I'm on there as well. Fabulous. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> okay. Well, any any final words you want to share? Any messages of hope or anything else with people who have chronic dizziness? I think, as you said, just recognizing that chronic dizziness is just as common as and as pain or any other condition. Uh, and hopefully more and more people will understand that. And the more collaboration we have amongst ourselves worldwide as practitioners, the better. Mm -hmm. Get the message out there. Yes. <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Georgie. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you have any questions or comments, please drop them below. I love having conversations with you about the various topics we talk about. And if you enjoyed this video, you can like it, you can share the video, you can subscribe to my channel. If you're listening to this as a podcast, you can follow the podcast or please consider leaving it a five-star review if you think that we earned it from you today. So again, thank you everyone for tuning in and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Bye Thanks everyone. Much. Bye.